a couple years ago when we took on this project with David Morris uh, that started right here at a, a restaurant. Uh, we had just finished the um, LGBT conference that Dave and I were, uh, uh, we had a couple of um, uh, volunteers from Concordia, two young African women. So we sat with them after, and we had some, something to eat and asking questions about Africa and everything. And I, I said to David, right after the meeting, I said, you know, I'm thinking, how about an how about a African market study that, that, that points out the difference between this group and then the uh, U.S. African Americans? And David right away said, yeah, I love it. And then we had to go through the process of, you know, giving it a name, the brand, and we came up with the U.S. Emerging African Market after consulting with African leaders from uh, L.A. and D.C., New York, and here. And so that was the beginning. Then the hard work came, and, and we, had some, we had some real heroes with us. One of them was the Minneapolis Foundation. Sandy Vargas stepped up to the plate and funded pretty much a lot of the, a lot of the expense for the study. So um, we're, we're here today. I think it's about two years old, the study, David, but as you're going to explain. But we're here today to, um, to um, have um, the, um, the study um, come to um, Minnesota and to be able to present this. To introduce uh, David is a good friend of ours, Tom Gita. Tom Gita um, arrived here in Minnesota 22 years ago, came in to study really from Kenya. And um, I came here to Minnesota and survived the first winter. He said, well, I, I, I can stick it out. I can, you know, man, and <laughs> I can make it. And, and, and uh, you know, this, this is a great story about the, the African community and, 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 and how entrepreneurial they are, you know, as we're finding now, you know, it's business and it's in that DNA about coming here and taking opportunities. Fifteen years ago, he started Mashali the African community newspaper. And in between that, he worked for Best Buy and had some other gigs. But um, uh, the most important part is today, he's a Metro State alum. alum. And uh, yeah, Tom Gita, yeah. So let's, uh, let's, have him, uh, let's have him come up, and he's going to introduce David Morris. Tom. Uh, thank you, Rick. Yeah, well, actually, I would like to commend uh, Rick for pushing for that study. Um, you know, our market, uh, the African uh, immigrant market, is uh, is very is quite ignored, and uh, not very many people know about it. Uh, they do see a lot of Africans around uh, uh, the Twin Cities for those who are from here, uh, but on the whole, uh, there actually uh, hasn't been uh, a study until two years ago uh, that really looked at uh, at us as a market that, uh, you know, that can uh, contribute to your to company's bottom line uh, as, you know, as uh, consumers. So, uh, you know, when Rick um, pushed for the study uh, three years ago, uh, you know, I was very excited and I was actually already involved with Rick at that time uh, on behalf of my newspaper. Uh, so that this just took it to a whole other level and uh, we have become really uh, integrated uh, with Rick and the Multicultural Conference. So uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, David Moss. Uh, he's the president and CEO of uh, New American Dimensions, uh, one of the nation's uh, preeminent ethnic marketing research firms. Uh, Mr. Moss is a frequent speaker on the U.S. multicultural markets and is known for having worked with some of the most successful companies uh, in the United States in developing innovative and profitable ethnic marketing strategies. Mr. Moss has over 25 years in market research and brand management and strategic planning experience in the U.S. and Mexico, uh, working with companies like uh, Le Levi, Levi Strauss, uh, Gillette de Mexico, Honda Motors, and many others. Uh, he holds a Master of International Management degree from Thunderbird, uh, the American Graduate School of International Management, uh, where he specialized in consumer marketing, uh, which was one was of my favorites uh, in, in, in college, and uh, special, with a special emphasis on Latin America. He also has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of New Hampshire, where he studied psychology and sp Japanese studies. So him and I already are in agreement because he's multilingual like I am. I speak three languages. So. And uh, I just learned actually today that he's also an accomplished author. Uh, his book is called Multicultural Intelligence, 
uh, with a subtitle, Make or Break Rules for Marketing to Race, Ethnicity, and Sexual Orientation, which I believe is available on Amazon, on Amazon or on his website as well. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. David Moss of New America Dimensions. Good afternoon. Is the sound? You know, I, I, I'm, I, I made a kind of cardinal mistake as a presenter. I'm reading a, a book on presenting. And, and, I, and I've realized that I break just about every single rule that's in this book. And the first rule they say, don't thank your audience, because everybody, but you know, I, I, I gotta break that rule. Thank you so much for, for, for having me. And, and, and to allow me to, to present on this subject, as everybody has said, that it always gets ignored, or there are so many misconceptions about the African segment. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I'm like, like, like the people that spoke before me were evangelists about multicultural marketing, and often, you know, I find myself in front of corporate America saying, you know, the African American segment, you know, they speak English, but there are, are very strong reasons to market to that segment. Well, now I'm gonna say to you that what I'm gonna talk about is not the African American segment. It's a segment that uh, is 1.6 million people strong in the United States, largely uh, an immigrant segment, and uh, one that, uh, I'm not gonna show a lot of numbers in terms of economic buying power, but you will see uh, how some of the stereotypes that we Americans have about Africans, uh, going back to the Tarzan days, I think, uh, are just totally erroneous. Have you guessed what these pictures are? This is Africa. This is Ghana. Uh, wanted to start to, 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 to uh, show you that there's Kentucky Fried Chicken there. It's not all about villages and, and, and people running barefoot. It, so much negative stuff gets uh, talked about, and we'll hear about from the respondents talking about the negativity that gets projected on Africa and the misconceptions. Um, the other thing the book says is don't apologize. So I'm not gonna apologize, but I am gonna thank you for uh, listening to data. This is a, a, a summary of some research that we conducted two years ago, uh, as Rick mentioned. Rick and many of you here in the audience had the foresight to, to, to realize that this is really cutting edge stuff to do a study. To my, to my knowledge, it is the only study that is available on marketing to Africans. There is government, there's some government stuff, you can get information from the census, but, and, and the best indicator that I have, my company, we do a lot of market research studies, and you can find them on our website, uh, newamericandimensions.com. Um, we track who goes to the website, you'll be asked to fill in a form. Um, it's this African study that I, I would say every three days somebody's going on our website and, and, and downloading the study. And I, I would say judging by the names of the people that enter, most of them seem to be Africans. There's a real passion about, about Africa among Africans. And one of the reasons is because Africans get so ignored. And as a marketer, I think that that means real opportunity because as with any multicultural segment, uh, multicultural people don't always see themselves represented in the media or targeted in, in advertising, and, and it's such an opportunity to, to acknowledge a group and, and, and to make a connection. So, um, a little bit about methodology, and then I'm gonna show you a video. We did, uh, this is a, a quantitative and a qualitative study, and we talked to, uh, I believe it was about 500 people in, uh, did, it was a national survey, and we also did intercepts and interview, in-person interviews in some top markets, including Minneapolis, uh, Washington DC, New York, Los Angeles, and some big African markets. And we did focus groups in uh, Washington DC, Minneapolis, and Los Angeles. The video that you're about to see is gonna be a compilation of some of the, the uh, focus groups that we did, as well as we did some one-on-one -on -one interviews. So uh, without further ado, uh, Robert, if you, would play the video. The audio portion. Okay, all right. Well, if you go to my website, uh, you can watch the video. There's some interesting things in the video. That young man right there uh, talked about one of, the, one of the themes that was very frequent, what we heard about. Uh, African young man, I uh, forget what country he was, what West African, uh, and he, he's talking about joining the black dormitory 
at his university and the difficulties that he faced fitting in. Um, you know, when I talk about the African American market, one of the points that I make is, you know, we had segregation, we had Jim Crow laws for many, many years in this country and uh, led to a very strong culture of African Americans. And one of the challenges that Africans face, one of the challenges that this young man faces is the expectation that he act a certain way. Because he's black, the expectation is he should act like an African American. He doesn't talk like an African American. He doesn't share the same experiences as African Americans. And that's one of the things that he was talking about. And, and we're going to see some of that in the data. Uh, one of these challenges that Africans face not only are the perceptions not only from uh, white people in the general market, but, but from African Americans as well, because they don't fit into the molds that uh, have been created for them. So let's uh, get to the data, okay? Um, why do Africans come here in the first place? Well, economic opportunity was, was the number one answer. And remember, too, when it comes to Africa, there's great diversity. Um, where's, where's Fatima? Is Fatima here? The African lady? There's different... Uh, Africa, huh? From Ke you're from Kenya. Many, many Indian people live in the continent of Africa. I also want to make the point that uh, in the quantitative study as well as the qualitative, we focused on uh, what is sometimes called sub-Saharan Africa. So we didn't talk to people in Northern Africa countries, very distinct uh, culture, very strong uh, colonization by, by, uh, by Arabs back in the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. So uh, we focus more on the below the Sahara. Um, people from Somalia, many came here as refugees. So there's a lot of, a lot of diversity. But seeking econo economic opportunity uh, was one of, one of the main reasons. And Rick was talking earlier about the, the, the spirit of entrepreneurism that exists in the community. We heard a lot of that. Uh, people that came here that, that have started their own businesses and, and, and are doing very, very well. And that's going to be an overall theme that I'm going to talk about is just how well Africans uh, are doing in this country, or at least the ones that we, 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 we surveyed, um, in spite of what seem to be many, many difficulties that they face. So let's talk about the difficulties. Uh, culture shock was, uh, came up all the time. It was just very very strange experience coming to the United States. And again, as I mentioned, we heard again and again about the existing racial dynamic that exists in the United States that's been cemented over the last 400 years and just not quite knowing how they, how they would fit into that racial di dynamic. And not only that, but Americans, black or white, not quite knowing what to, how to, what to make of, of these folks. Language, you know, with any immigrant group uh, it, it, it was, was, was a problem, although uh, many speak English, uh, many come from countries that were, uh, like Kenya, that were, that were colonized by, by, by the English. Figuring out the American system created uh, lots, of, lots of conflict. How does it work? I, again, sophisticated people looking to open up bank accounts, looking to get cell phones, looking to get internet connectivity. How does it all work? Homelessness, I'm sorry, homelessness, homesickness and, and, and loneliness were, 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 were big themes. You're going to hear about the importance of family uh, and uh, people missing their families and missing their countries of origin. Uh, many come over as students, they come over alone and uh, get settled here in the United States. Uh, lack of respect in the community that, uh, again, People have misconceptions about what Africa is all about. And, uh, you know, people have this image that everybody in Africa comes from a very small, poor, dare I say, AIDS-infested, famine-infested village. We heard so much of that. And as you can see by those photographs, it's clearly not uh, all of Africa. And it's clearly not the case for many, many people. Uh, holding on to their traditions music, food, art, religion, family values, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and passing them on to one's kids. Um, there's a wonderful book written by a lady named Mary Waters, and it's not about Africans. It's, about, it's another aspect of the African diaspora. 
uh, people from, uh, from the West Indies living in New York. And what, what she found was that uh, for these black folks that came from the Caribbean, one of their biggest challenges was passing on culture to their kids because what ended up happening to this community in New York is they assimilated, the kids assimilated to African American culture, uh, to a very urban hip hop kind of, again, you know, it was New York, right? Uh, 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 African American culture, and they were losing their connectivity to, to in their identity as, as, as Jamaicans, uh, even, even as, as, as Haitians. Um, we heard a lot of the same thing here with, with people from Africa. How do I instill in my kids a sense of African identity when they're just going to be bombasted with expectations that they behave like African Americans? Uh, so much pride. Uh, a lot of teary eyes. I, I, I teared up during the focus groups. Respondents teared up. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I just have so much affection for Africans having done this project. Got to confess, I've never been to Africa other than Egypt, so it's not an area where I hold particular expertise, and I learned so much from talking to these folks. And uh, one of the things that we often do when we do research is ask, what does it mean to you to be Hispanic? What does it mean to you to be a gay person? What does it mean to be African? And number one answer, almost unanimously, I think, was respect. Uh, respect for others, respect for our elders. Um, growing up in a very, very uh, family-oriented system where discipline was done, was meted out with, with, with love. Uh, politeness. And uh, I'm, I'm going to read some of these because I don't want to miss. Hospitality. I said, you know, you invite somebody into your home and you feed them. You, 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 you treat them like a member of your family. Um, religion was very strong. And again, much, much religious diversity. Christianity, uh, Islam are, 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 are both uh, strong. You have Judaism in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, education. Focus on education. Um, a lot of that is a function of the folks that come over here who are coming to get a, 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 a high, higher level of education. But also in Africa, that's one of the things that's, that's pounded into people's heads is the importance of education. And uh, um, a receptivity to different ideas and people, and I'm not quite sure how to express this, but it was really a real theme. Uh, I, I, I kind of relate this to the level of sophistication of the people that we talk to. Uh, obviously, people that, that have come from another continent, to live in another continent, but just very, very, uh, is cosmopolitan the right word? Just very sophisticated in terms of being pe people, here's the word I want, they're people of the world. They're very worldly in the sense of having knowledge of the world, having very international groups of friends. Uh, many have married people uh, from, from other countries, black and non-black. Uh, and uh, again, the, the, the theme of raising children with a strong African identity is, is a big challenge, and it's also a very strong aspiration. Again, family, family dependency, and we hear a lot of this, you certainly hear about it, uh, you know, when we're talking about the Asian segment, all, all, all these multicultural segments, uh, right? To a certain extent, that's because in the United States, we very much value independence. Right? That's kind of, you know, our country was based on, on a declaration of independence and where we, 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 we pride ourselves on being entrepreneurial and self-sufficient. Well, well, that's not true for, for, other, for some other cultures and particularly African cultures pride themselves on a dependence. They, family members take care of themselves and they care of each other. Another core pillar, which I have never heard in, um, with another multicultural group, was altruism. Giving to others is, is of, deemed to be of high importance with, 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 with Africans. And of course the music, which is just wonderful, and the food are, 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 are as you can see in this next slide, um, pillars. But uh, it's hard, as I mentioned, in all of these communities because uh, many of the communities are small. And again, um, it, it, it's, it's a real challenge for immigrants to hold on to that 
to hold on to their culture. And as I mentioned, it's particularly difficult for Africans, given the, the racial dynamic of this country. I can't uh, talk enough about racism, and I feel kind of funny talking about it, and I'll, I'll let you know why. And I've shared this story, I think, with, with a couple of people yesterday. Uh, when, when, when we first came out with a study, uh, we talked a lot about the racism, because it was, it was a very pervasive theme. And when I say racism, feeling of, these are Africans feeling that they are the, the victims of racism. And I talked a lot about it, and I talked a lot about racism coming from the African American community. And uh, I, 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 uh, I got chided by some African American friends that said, you know, we're working really, really hard towards developing a sense of black unity, and you're not really helping the matter. And I, I, I'm very much torn on this, because on the one hand, I feel that based on what I heard, uh, certain, the dialogue is a good thing, and that it's good to, to, to have dialogue. Uh, by the same token, I've kind of toned down in many presentations uh, the extent that I talk about it, because I want to be helping the communities that I'm researching, and I don't want to cause any harm. But I do think that, uh, that, that, that this group of people here is a very sophisticated group of people, and I'm just going to tell you what I heard, and uh, maybe we can talk about what the implications are. But racism came up again and again and again, uh, and uh, pe getting made fun of because of their accent, because of the way that they dress, um, and, and again, not filling the expectations of how black people should, should behave. We asked some questions in the quantitative. We measured it. Um, some particular challenges. 62% of our respondents said that Africans are usually portrayed negatively in the U.S. media. And when we probed in the qualitative uh, about what these stereotypes were, we heard about Tarzan, and we heard about the villages, and we heard about, we heard about poverty. Uh, so it has many different faces. Um, and yet, at the same time, 59% felt that their education, their skills are, 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 are valued in the workplace. 31% said they experienced racism. It came up much stronger uh, in the qualitative. And I think the, one of the reasons that it didn't come up higher in the quantitative is because we use the phrase often. Uh, you know, you change a word to frequently or sometimes, and the numbers start to change. So let me talk about relationships with, with, with African Americans. The, the gentleman in the upper left-hand corner, that's, that's the image that, uh, that many people have of, of what Africans are, are all about. And, and I heard a lot of negativity, and I don't want to dwell on it, uh, perceptions that some, some, some said that African Americans, or that some African Americans have said that they were the ones who sold their ancestors into slavery. We heard some really strong stuff. And again, there was lots of emotion, which again gave me so much respect. Uh, you don't like to hear, as a researcher, you don't like to hear stereotypes. And, and, and at the same time, uh, it was a very, very moving group of people. So enough said about identity. Let's talk about, about marketing. Okay, we asked them about brands. We asked about all kinds of behavior. Um, very brand loyal group of people. These were some of the brands, uh, Mercedes, uh, Land Rover. It seems like uh, a lot of the Africans we talked to are into Macs <laughs> that, were, that, are, that were Apple loyalists. Um, a real appreciation for showing black people in advertising on the one hand, and on the other hand, showing people that aren't just perfect models, showing other people of color showing models that don't have perfect figures and things like that. A couple of them mentioned an ad where they, it, it featured a woman with a, with a, with a, a, a scar from a C-section. We like to see real people. In America, it seems that you're showing us nothing but perfect people, perfect white people. And if a company is willing to acknowledge people of color, there was a real appreciation. And I think that this represents a real opportunity to connect with this community. Like many, like many immigrant groups, word of mouth is big. Um, it's a typical profile of an immigrant. You come to, we, we would be the same way if we went to live in another country. You start asking people, particularly people that come from your own country of origin, where's the best place to buy a tie? Where's the best place to go grocery shopping? Um, and, and, and this African segment was, 
was no different. But you know, they are watching TV, and I'll get into what networks they're, they're, they're watching. Um, when it came to price loyalty, again, there were differences by market that reflects the diversity of this, this community. Um, Washington, D.C., where you have a lot of Nigerians, um, very, very brand conscious, spending a lot of money in department stores. Here in, here in Minneapolis, shopping more in, uh, in, in discount stores. Um, most talked about value, all about value, and, and brand loyalty was a, was a theme that went, uh, went across the board. There was a, a desire, again, we see this with many uh, immigrant communities, uh, a, a skepticism of ordering online. Not a, not a strong theme, but you know, a, a desire to touch a product and to see a product before buying it. So here's some data, and again, I'm mixing up the qualitative with the quantitative. Um, you like to shop around and find the right product and price for you. Two-thirds of the people agreed with that. You definitely prefer African uh, rather than food from other cultures, 58%. So, you know, real opportunity to sell them food. And you'll see in a slide coming up that they are shopping in mainstream markets and they're shopping at African markets as well. There's this mixing of cultures uh, that, that, that takes place. You buy products that agree with your religious values, about 46%. This was particularly uh, a strong theme with, with the Islamic population that we talked to. Uh, many, of, many of whom fall in the laws of halal and uh, you know, would only buy halal food. And uh, you don't mind buying insurance policies, 42%. I'm going to show you some ownership rates. Again, it's going to uh, represent uh, the sophistication, I think, of this market. So. Where are the leading places that you go to shop? 33% said supermarkets. Again, it was a national survey, so it depended what supermarket depended on the market. But yet 18% said that they shop in African grocery stores. And it was very common for us, most frequently. Um, what we found was that uh, a huge majority shop in both. So that you'd go to the general market store to get, uh, I don't know, toilet paper or, or you know, bread maybe, and you'd go to the African store to get get your local food that, uh, you, that, you, that, you, that you miss. Um, we talked a lot about financial planning. And uh, again, th these are folks that are investing, um, very, very active in terms of seeking out financial information, investing their money, um, which it, 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 it is so striking. It was so striking for me, the contrast between the behavior of the folks that we talked to and the stereotypes that exist because they couldn't be more diametrically uh, opposed. Many, many of these folks are working hard. They're working multiple jobs. Again, hard work is a pillar of the community that I didn't mention. Uh, but again, you know, they come here to work. They come here in, in exploration of, exp of economic opportunity. And that's another stressor is holding down a couple of jobs and trying to Trying to, trying to build a business or, 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 or trying to establish a family. This data, again, keep in mind the data is two years old, which is not going to impact this slide as much as the, the next, some other slides. But these are, these are very high numbers um, for, for an immigrant group. Nearly all have checking accounts and saving a, accounts, uh, credit cards. You know, we, we do a lot of work with, with Latinos, for instance. Credit card rates are tend to be much lower. There's a, there's a cultural belief in Latin America, credito es un vicio, credit's a vice. Uh, not so with, with uh, this community. We heard a lot about alternative financial uh, sources, uh, people from the same country or the same community pooling their resources and, 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 and helping, uh, loaning money and pooling it so somebody could buy a house and then you know, pass it on kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of thing. And uh, look, 81% uh, on the quantitative said that they have 401k plans, 13%. These are high numbers. Again, I want to point to the, the sophistication of this community. Auto insurance, a lot of cultures do not buy auto insurance. Hispanic culture, for instance, uh, very low rates of, uh, I don't want to say auto insurance, of insurance in general. You don't want to attract the evil eye. Uh, you, you know, you know, 
You don't want to bring on bad events by, by even talking about them, unpleasant events. High ownership of this as well, even 58% ownership of dental insurance. So um, I'm going to, uh, okay, um, personal computer. These are the numbers that I, I would imagine would be even higher. But two years ago, these were very high numbers, 85% owning a personal computer. Um, I think that there, there is still a digital divide in the United States. It's closing, but it certainly does not uh, seem to be a problem for the majority of the Africans uh, that we spoke to, just a very connected community, 73% uh, having internet access, cable TV, multiple telephone lines, 32% have gaming systems. Uh, this, is a, this is a community that's, that, that, that's very wired. 96% own a cell phone, and I would, uh, we didn't ask the question two years ago, I wish we had, but how many own a smartphone? Uh, my, my, my guess would be that many of these folks do own smartphones. What are they watching on TV? Look at this. CNN came up again and again. NPR, BBC. You know, we didn't, we didn't hear a whole lot of, you know, I didn't hear a whole lot of MTV. I didn't hear a whole lot of even network TV. Again, the sophistication of, and the international mindset of these folks was just, uh, was just ast astounding. And, and the internationalness came up again and again in terms of a choice of spouse, or, or the type of music that I listen to, and the kind of food that I consume, and in this particular case, the kind of media that, that I consume. So, uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but this is, this is what most people think of when they think of Africa, right? Now, don't we all think of lions and elephants? That's, that's what's pounded into our heads. Uh, I, I, I don't have the number, but a very, high number of Africans are actually urban, but uh, that's not the image that is projected in the, meeting, uh, in, in the media. Uh, Coming to America, you've seen that movie? Um, that, that, that movie came up a lot as kind of, kind of the, the, ima the image of kind of, you know, a redneck yokel uh, image applied to Africans, uh, kind of reflecting the way that they felt Americans saw them. What to do, they, say, said, they said so often, show real people, show us as happy people. We're a very happy culture. And you turn on the media and we are just suffering. Um, show the other side of Africa. Not that we want you to ignore AIDS and, 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 and famine and, and, and you know, some of the problems, but there is a whole other side. And, so many of our respondents said, you know, that is my experience. I have happy memories of home. We have a happy family. We have a happy middle class family. We love our kids. We love spending our time with our kids. We love to eat. We love to dance. We love to listen to music. And we don't see that. And, and if a company were to show that, reflect that side of Africa, in, in an ad, we would, we, we would be loyal to that company because we just don't see it. Um, here's per, per participation rates uh, in media activity. I don't know if you can see that. You'll, you'll, all, you'll all have a copy of the deck. Again, the point being the sophistication. 43% were on Facebook two years ago. I imagine that uh, those numbers have probably doubled at this point. Um, not a whole lot watching African movies in theaters. Um, Sophisticated group of people. I think what I'm going to do, I think I've covered most of the relevant data. Um, what I do want to say is uh, there is a report on our website that you can access for those of you that are really into the numbers. It's, I know that it's uh, late in the day. Here I am apologizing, just like the book said not to do. Um, I, I did want to make the point uh, Oh, actually, a few more slides I want to show. We asked, what, how many hours a day do you spend watching media, TV, websites? And uh, again, overwhelmingly watching much more, watching a lot of English language media. Uh, that includes on the internet, on the radio, although there is consumption of, 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 of African language media. So there is a, a, an opportunity to, to, to target uh, Africans uh, using, using African language media and English language media targeting Africans. Again, 
CNN, uh, number one network, number one network consumed as a news channel, is C CNN. Um, these numbers here, in terms of the internet, would be much higher today, but using Yahoo, using Facebook, um, but also African language websites. Uh, Hiram.com, African News, Nigerian website, but again, very small numbers, only 3%. So, so you are, to a certain extent, reaching these folks with, with, with your general market media. Like any multicultural segment, there's such an opportunity to, to, to do targeting because they're largely ignored. So let me recap, and then I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get some, uh, some folks up here if you have questions. Um, maybe, maybe Nathan and Tom can ha will come up in a minute. Let me just recap. Um, Hard-working people, very ambitious, working two jobs. Family is the biggest priority that we heard about. Respect. Education is a top priority. Uh, optimism, that with hard work, hard work will bring success. Focus on community, sending money, lots of sending money back to relatives at home and uh, helping the community here in the United States. Keep in mind that African, -American, that African immigrants consider themselves to be African, um, not African American. And uh, a lot of them commented, when I go back to Africa, though, I feel very American. I realize that I've, I've, I've changed a lot. Um, they stay in touch with their culture. They're looking for opportunities to stay in touch with their culture. And as we've mentioned, I beat it to death, but very, very different from, from African Americans. The point I really want to make here is I think so many companies do not, do, do not even acknowledge. They, they look at the census numbers and they, where black is checked off. And, and they feel that they're targeting these 1.6 million people with their African-American uh, targeted marketing. And it's just, it ain't true. Very brand loyal, uh, word of mouth, very important. Spiritual folks, uh, religion plays a very, very important role in almost all of the people that we talk to and shopping a wide range of stores. Um, Financial planning, for those of you that are in banking, lots of opportunities there. And uh, if, you're, if you're best buy, if you're in the gadget business, you're in the electronics business, uh, lots of opportunities there. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the presentation here. Uh, if I can leave you with any thought, it is that, that this is a very sophisticated group of people and yet very diverse. And, and uh, 1.6 million people is, is not a number to, to, to sneeze at. So this is for real opportunities here, particularly here in Minneapolis, as you know. So I'm going to break another rule. They say not to thank the audience at the end, but I am very grateful uh, that you, you've listened to all this data at the end of uh, a, a, a great day. So thank you very, very much. Do you have... Nathan, Tom, maybe you can help me. Uh, does anybody have questions about the data or about, about Africa? I thank you so much, Seth, for your presentation. And I wish encourage you to visit more countries in Africa beside uh, Egypt. Go to Ghana, go to Nigeria, where I came from. Um, there are quite some good and very uh, enterprising communities there. We know we are very diverse, 54 countries, 50, 54 cultures, but those basic things are common, very hospitable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, everything you said is very accurate. Um, I just want to make a statement here. In the first place, thank America for welcoming us into here. And we have mutual benefits, what to gain from us and what we already gained from you. I came to this country in 1978. My first child that I had when I was in college in St. Cloud, she's going to be 32 next month. So I'm not really new to American society. One, one thing that diaspora, if I can use that language, you know, is a bridge between America and Africa. 
So if you can tap into resources like me, you will see that the benefits and the positiveness is, there's no boundary to it. Um, that's my first thanks to America for welcoming us into here. To be more specific, to the African, African Americans, I mean, black people that are Americans but have African origin. I want to also thank them because they have done some work, so I've laid some grounds before people like me came over here in the civil rights battle. So they've cleared the ground, they've done quite some enormous work and achievements which help people like me, I came here with high school education and I've got, I got a first degree, I got a second degree. After that, I went back to do another associate degree program. So what I want to say here, for we Africans, we have a very, very strong education. Now, acquirement, achievement, and talents that this country can tap into. Finally, the bridge I said earlier on, you can check this out. The world natural resources, about at least about 50 to 60 percent of them are right now in the continent of Africa. From oil to gold to diamond, you name it, there is no element. There's no blessing of the ground given by God Almighty that is not present in Africa. So we've got a lot to offer America. Don't leave it to China alone. China has so much liberated some parts of Africa that I say, wait a minute, what are we doing here? So for anybody that is interested in these economic ties, we Africans that are here, gone to school here, understood American culture, and also part of Africa, we are the best to use. And I'm sure it's going to be a mutual benefit. Remember, with modern technology now, there's no geographic, geographical boundary anymore. We can both be here, and your corporation or your company can be thriving in Africa. The communication Gadgets, infrastructures are already they've already been laid down. So that's my that's in addition as a supplemental uh, message to what Mr. Moss yes. has given to us. Let me tell you, we are united and we are together, and we can move ahead and help each other bring back America uh, economies, economic uh, status, and also develop those 54 nations beyond what they are today. That's my news. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would you, either of you, like to say some words? Tell us about Africa. Africans. <laughs> um, well, hi, everyone. My name is Nathan White. So right off the bat, um, <laughs> as you can see, um, if you, and I actually had this done, um, the data, I think that Saul was talking about earlier, how you go through and you run your database and you find out, hey, where's this person from? I show up as a white Caucasian male. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's just a good understanding of how, uh, to our last speaker's point, um, I'm from, originally from Liberia, and I am very much American as I am African. Liberia was founded by free slaves that went back to Africa and found us, hence my name, uh, Nathan White. Um, I know no other name, I know no other dialect but English. And again, one of the reasons I'm dressed like this is, yeah, if I showed up looking like Tom or looking like David, you would probably think of me as an ordinary black American. Um, but until I take off some layers and put something else on, then you understand that I have a little extra to me. And I think that's the bottom line of his presentation, is when folks um, don't really try to 
understand any demographics, whoever we're talking about here, they really don't try to get uh, past the first level of um, the outer shell, you will miss the mark. Um, because if you're not speaking to folks the way uh, they want to be spoken to, um, you will definitely be speaking to somebody else other than them. So, thank you. Any, any, we'll be happy to take any Q&A. Yeah. if there was any segmentation in the data that you found for the Africans, did you see any different levels or socioeconomic status? Was there any segmentation? Yeah, and in fact, uh, if, if, you, if you go through the complete, you, can you hear me back there? You go through the complete report, we, we, we looked at uh, religion, we looked at country of origin, we looked at East Africa versus West Africa versus Central Africa, uh, you know, absolutely, uh, a, a lot of differences, especially by country of origin. A and religion drove a lot of things like food, uh, food choice, um, so much diversity in this. Again, we talk about Africa like it's a country. Right? It's, a, it's, it's obviously not a country, <laughs> continent. I think there might not be uh, straight data, at least for the, uh, for the Twin Cities market that I'm more familiar with. Um, you know, you, you Let's say, for example, the, you know, the five top uh, countries of origin for uh, the state here, you know, is uh, number one is obviously Somalis. Uh, second, uh, number two, we have Ethiopians. And the third are the Liberians, where Nathan is from. Uh, number four are the Kenyans, where I'm from. And then number five are the Nigerians. That's kind of how the, the ranking goes. So out of the 100,000 that you hear are in the state here, uh, th that's kind of how the numbers will break. So. If you're marketing to those particular segments, uh, you'll know obviously that overwhelmingly the Somalis will be uh, Muslim. Okay, so that's key to know is, is if you're into grocery shop, I mean, uh, food marketing and that kind of thing, so you have to be aware of that. So I think maybe in the second study that we, uh, that hopefully somebody will recommission so it can be updated, uh, you know, maybe that's kind of the info that we will uh, uh, put in. Yeah, I can add a little bit more to that. Um, of all the immigrant groups, including um, uh, Asian Americans, Africans are the highest income when they first get to the U.S. So they make the most money of any immigrant group when they first get to the U.S. Um, again, because these are already highly educated, um, highly um, uh, mobile folks. Um, as they come here, you know, maybe uh, they get into the general population and then, um, you know, their circumstances change a little bit. Um, but yeah, right off the bat. So yeah, I, I, I have some extra data that, that point to that. And again, um, if you segment it by regions, South Africans um, are the highest income of Africans, um, follow I think by the North Africans, then West Africans, then East Africans. So depending on where you're from within that region, it can be broken down to the income level of those folks. Um, so yeah, so again, to Tom uh, and David's point, it's not a one size fits all, depending on where, you know, what your marketing um, uh, strategies are, depending on, uh, there are 10 different states that have a wide, good, solid population of Africans in the US. So again, um, to the first map that was drawn when saw the his presentation, you don't wanna just do the entire country, you wanna segment it and based on where you're looking at, you want to go at, you know, is it West Africans here? Is the East Africans here? Is the South Africans there? Um, and can anybody tell me the number one state for where Africans are? Nope. It's on there. California. Nope. California. California has, yeah, California. It must be Ethiopians. Like LA's got a huge Ethiopian population. Um, it's a variety, it's a variety of Africans. Yeah, but yeah California has the highest um, population of Africans. I know I was, uh, I was 40 years old when I, when I found out my, my father wasn't Pedro. He had a real complicated name. So when he arrived in Minnesota, he became Pete. So the, wow. yeah, it was, it was Takario, you know, some, you know, I didn't know. The guy said, well, your dad's was, it's not Pete, it's Takario. And, and no wonder he changed. But is that happening with Africans? Because I, 
I, I was getting a phone call from a very well-known um, uh, African here uh, that I worked with, but then I'd see the name on the, on the phone, man. It was a, a whole different thing, so maybe you can tell us. Uh. Actually, there is some of that, actually. Um, you know, we have, uh, if, uh, Rick, I think you know, we have the African Awards that we put on every year, and uh, two, three years ago, the, the keynote speaker was uh, this uh, CNN uh, CNN Morning, one of the CNN Morning reporters, uh, her name used to be, uh, her na well, her name now is Lola Ogunaike. That was her full name. But actually, she had shortened her first name. Her first name used to be some long Nigerian name. And uh, because she grew up here, you know, her parents are from Nigeria, uh, it's, the people tend to change their names actually are the kids of the immigrants. Uh, but uh, the immigrants themselves, from my experience, I mean, the first generation, you know, like myself, we rarely change our names. Uh, but our children, you know, depending on what name you've given them, uh, they, you know, and how, what their experience is in school, uh, you, know, they, you know, they might be tempted to change their name just, you know, just to kind of fit in. Um, because she, this particular reporter from CNN, she said that uh, her, mom, um, her dad used to tell her that, hey, you know, uh, if you become famous, uh, then they'll, they'll learn how to say your name, okay? Which, uh, you, know, we, you know, we have Obama now too, so you, you probably had a point. Uh, Fatima Franzine, um, I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to add something I thought might be helpful. I came to United States in 1973 for opportunities and education, and I was talking to Tom a little bit, and during the, uh, I, I think he was very young then, but during the 1970s, uh, well, 60s, 63, when Kenya became independent, things had changed, and during the 70s, um, my family uh, migrated from India to uh, East Africa, to, well, to Zanzibar, and then to Kenya, and uh, we started a lot of businesses, but unfortunately, we lost everything through socialism, and the government took everything away, so it was very devastating. And now, you know, things are different in Kenya. And um, the second thing, you were talking about education. Uh, when I first came here, I started college at North Hennepin Community College, and I took uh, English 101. And it was a breeze, and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, is English 101 is equal to, was equal to my last year of elementary school. So the standard of English is very high. And um, during that time, it was British system. And so uh, when I was growing up, I went to school, well, of course, in Kenya, the elementary school and high school. I could not understand the British system. I just had a tough time. It was too difficult. And I really appreciated the American system of education. You know, I could understand it better. It seemed like it was a better fit for me. And um, so I'm glad I'm here in the United States. I really appreciate it. And the last thing was we were talking about racism. Um, well, when I was growing up uh, in school, um, I didn't experience any of racism. I had lots of um, uh, African friends, Indian friends, British friends, we all hung around together. And so, uh, and, and, and in fact, even though I was brought up in a, oh, I hate to say this, even though I was brought up in a wealthy family, um, all my friends were very poor because um, I did not fit into the Heidi mighty hoity-toity class, you know. So that was an important, and I felt, felt everybody was equal under the eyes of God. So that's how I felt. And the last thing is, you were talking about the racism. Uh, during the 80s, I visited, uh, when I went to Kenya, I met a, a flight attendant who was African American, and he was complaining about, he was very frustrated with the African community. And so I said, well, why are you so frustrated? He felt being discriminated in Kenya. He felt he was, he, it wasn't a good fit for him. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> He just didn't understand the African culture, so we had a very long conversation about the African culture. So I think it kind of works vice versa. So, so I thought I would share that. Thank you. I want to introduce um, a, um, a new member of the, of the faculty here, um, uh, Jesse uh, Bethke Gomez. 
And um, uh, Jesse was um, uh, vice president of the university, he is a vice president of university advancement and executive director of the Metropolitan State University Foundation. Uh, Jesse served from 1995 through 2011 as president and CEO of CLUES, a highly successful nonprofit organization located in St. Paul and Minneapolis. And if you've ever, ever done any work with the Latino community, I think that that's probably the number one organization that you would hear uh, from their mouths about how it's, it's helped the community and how it still continues to be, uh, to be one of the leaders. Un under Bethy, uh, Bethy Gomez's leadership, Clues has been recognized as one of the top 25 Hispanic nonprofit agencies in America and one of the, one of the 140 top workplaces in the Twin Cities. In 2011, he was among 100 national leaders who participated in the White House Hispanic Policy Summit and in 2008, he was listed among the 100 most influential healthcare leaders in Minnesota. Uh, Jesse has received special awards from the Ramsey County Bar Association, the Minnesota Hispanic Bar Association, La Prensa de Minnesota, and the country of Mexico. How about a hand for the new Metropolitan State faculty <laughs> member, Jesse Gomez. Jesse, thank you. Well, uh, we're, we're going to start off with, uh, with, with, a, with a, a question here. Um, um, just to uh, maybe uh, maybe hear about the uh, some some of the national implications about multicultural marketing, um, and 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 to be candid, um, is is do we see the growth of the multicultural communities and and all the data? Do, is is this is this something that's going to be welcomed in America? Is it seen as as um, as a threat? Is it seen as a changing of the guard? Is it a positive feeling? I just want get, to get, get some feelings from you as you're, you're in marketing, but beyond that, you know, in our everyday lives, I, I think there's some clients, maybe Jesse, you know, we all have clients who might be a little more sensitive, not understand it, or to some, and I think that's important to know as we all are interested in this. And, and how, do, how does America gonna handle this whole shift in, in, in what we see now is in, in the populations. Jesse, maybe you could lead that off. Sure. I, I want to talk about that from two standpoints. Uh, first, I think that, you know, the world is flat and it's smaller. And uh, I had worked to bring Vicente Fox, uh, the president of Mexico, to Minnesota. And we worked assiduously to uh, secure the Council of Mexico uh, in Minnesota as well. Minnesota at the time, in 2005, uh, its uh, exports to Mexico was approximately $400 million. And to answer this question, I thought that within five years we could double that. And so uh, behind the scenes, I played a, a pretty significant role with uh, uh, corporate America with uh, transnational uh, efforts. And in 2010, 2011 data, uh, Minnesota export, I think, $890 million to Mexico. So, you know, that's the answer right there. We, we played a big role uh, in opening the doors towards the sense of connection. And I think, to the second point, actually the next 20 years we'll see the most significant demographic shift in America and in Minnesota. For instance, by 2030, do you know what the fastest growing age group is in Minnesota? It's the 65 and above at 225%. All high school graduation uh, Graduates decreased by 10%. All diverse communities in Minnesota increased by 112%. And so we're embarking upon such a r significant change. The Governor's Workforce Development Council says that by 2018, 96% of all jobs vacated by the retiring boomer population will be filled by Generation U. And you know what the U stands for? 
the unretired. <laughs> so when you think of Metropolitan State University, a university that is so focused in understanding the needs of working adults, uh, has no achievement gaps, graduation rates. Actually, Metropolitan State University is one of the most prestigious, uh, profound universities in America serving the working adult. And so this university has to go to scale to be about securing and saving jobs. So I'm taking your question from this standpoint that in Minnesota, two different reports show that by the 2020s, we lose between 350,000 jobs to 500,000 jobs because we will not be producing enough baccalaureate degree people to keep those jobs. So education is a key. And from the standpoint of the marketing equation about reaching out to how people see the world, the lexicon, culture, the values, we really have to figure out how institutions like Metropolitan State University can play an even much larger role in education so that we're able to help people get those jobs. The other part of this is that as we diversify, it is just a, it is business goals where it is welcomed and it, is st and it stays when there's that sense of relationship. So, it, long answer, but I'm going to say that it don't, I don't believe it's a function of uh, multicultural. I think it's a, the, the natural changes that we're seeing demographically. And in the case of Mexico, where we doubled from 400 million to 890 million, I think it's a function of how do we open doors, make connections, so that business goes where it is welcomed and it stays where it's thanked. So very much uh, that could mean for us a thriving future if we take to heart now what we need to do in education and to take to heart about uh, the issue of language and culture. You know, coming from a, my background with clues, when I left the agency, we served 16 languages of people. And I finished uh, a chapter in an international book called Engaging Dur Diverse Communities. I'm one of 17 authors in that book. And our journey was this, that we found that the universal question for all peoples, when they'd come to our doors from 16 locations from throughout the world was this, what are your hopes and dreams for your children's future? Now that is a universal question. So when we start to really rethink from that broader perspective, marketing, does have a significant role to play in reaching the universal needs and interests that people have from language and culture that's very much a part of the global world that we live in today. Well, you know, it's really interesting. A few years back, uh, I did a study from Malvef, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, um, about gringo attitudes towards Latinos, specifically in Southern, in Southern California to see how, because um, there have been a lot of you know, ugly laws being passed, restricting, uh, restricting various uh, uh, things like the um, affirmative action in the University of California, things like that. And so we did this really interesting study and we asked a whole series of questions. We did a segmentation study based on it. And we basically found that um, 40, about 46% of the total population in Southern California were really loved the Latinos. These were non-Latinos, non uh, non-Hispanics. Uh, non and they, 46% loved Hispanics, um, loved them, no questions. 54% had issues, which is interesting, it's a slight majority. But most of them were minor issues. And only 5% really actively hated Latinos. But we asked a whole lot of other questions about things about their willingness or interest in learning languages, languages they wanted their children to learn. And even among the people, the 5% who hated Latinos, 53% of them wanted their children to learn Spanish. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting. So, <laughs> you know, um, some of the issues they were, they just were bothered by the Latinos being, you know, loud colors on their houses, parking their lawns on the drive, your cars on the drive, on the lawn, um, you know, 
many of them just simply didn't know Latinos. I mean, it's pretty hard to live in Southern California and not know Latinos, but some people did their best. Um, so it's really interesting to see um, how Latinos are, confront, are dealing with uh, an environment that, that was actually went before the big anti-immigration wave. Since the anti-immigration wave, we did a big study among Latinos to try to find out how they perceived all of this, the Joe Arpaios of the world and the Jan Brewers of the world and all of that backlash against them. A couple of the really most exciting uh, discoveries were um, how unified the whole Latino community is, including the communities that really don't have any skin in the game. The Cubans and the Puerto Ricans, they're legal. They don't have problems, right? Once a Cuban gets here, they're legal. Puerto Ricans are basically citizens. But they were just as involved and just as committed to the DREAM Act and, and a path to immigration, uh, immigration reform with a path to citizenship as the Latino, as the, as the Mexican Central American counterparts who have skin in the game. And then we looked at, by, you know, by, by uh, um, uh, political affiliation. And yes, uh, Latinos who affiliated as Republicans were significantly lower in their, in their uh, opposition to uh, SB 1070 and uh, in favor of the DREAM Act, but uh, they, were, they were at 73%. So they were significantly lower, but they were still very high. Basically, two-thirds of Latino Republicans were in favor of the DREAM Act and in favor of repeal of SB 1070 and, and really want immigration reform with the path to citizenship. So the Latino community itself is pretty united against this wave of anti-immigration and anti-immigrants fervor. So, um, so we are at least have our own act together. Uh, Paul or, or, or yeah, I mean, you asked Rick about the national implications. This is quite obvious, just to echo some of the data I shared this morning. Those three groups alone, Hispanics, African Americans, <laughs> and Asians, are 34% of the population today. They'll be 38, 39% in eight years, they'll be half the population by 2050. We live in a capitalist, consumer-driven country. Any marketer in any category that looks at that and says we're not gonna do anything, is, it should not be in that career, okay? This is, this is just, you know, imagine piles of money stocked to the moon being left on the table. So multicultural marketing, it's quite clear. It's not a question of if anymore, it's a question of when. What we're encountering now in many categories is resistance to doing something that organizations have not done in the past. And there are some valid reasons for that resistance. There's a lack of prior consumer data for many of these groups, either available in the public domain or available within corporate databases. Yeah, so first they wanna know, well, how big is it? And how do they interact with my product? And then there's, um, there's also some issues in terms of measuring the channels that reach these communities, media measurement. So we've got lots of media, but not all of it is audited. So there are a lot of valid concerns, but still, the visionary marketer needs to look at that data and say, for the rest of the lifetime of everybody in this room and the future generations coming, the next two, three generations at least, this is the future of consumerism. Do we, if, we're, if we want to be in business and we want to sell, do we care about these populations or not? Again, already more than half the population of the state of California, our single largest state market, population majority in our top 10 urban areas, fastest growing in 50 of the top 100 urban areas. So this is the future. Um, it's hard to imagine what, what's gonna happen after 2050. We could have a country where states start to declare Spanish a second official language. I mean, once there's majorities in these areas, we could start to see things like that. It's gonna revolutionize education. The whole concept of what being an American and what the general population looks like is right now undergoing a radical shift. Uh, so it's not that the general market's going away and multicultural is coming, it's that the general market is becoming multicultural. So there's all this inertia against corporate America to embrace this, but just the basic numbers dictate it has to happen. And the brands that move now and you know, make some mistakes and stumble a bit but learn and keep going will win. The ones that delay it will not win uh, or they're gonna have to spend enormous sums of money in the future to play catch up. It's just as simple as that. The foreign born population of the United States right now is something like 14%, 13.5%. We're at levels now that we were at back in 1910, you know, when Italians and my folks 
from Russia, you know, the Jews came over. Uh, we ended up closing the borders to a certain extent in 1924. Um, but my point is, you know, we're, we're, we're going through a demographic revolution, and it, it, it is natural that when so many people in the United States are foreign-born, that there's going to be resistance. I do a, I do a presentation where I, I, I begin with a P Patrick Buchanan interview on the, on the Daily Show. And John Stewart tears him to shreds. Patrick Buchanan is talking about his book. He calls it State of Emergency, the Third World Invasion of, of America. And, and his point is erroneous. And then I go through to demonstrate how it's erroneous. What Buchanan and many nativists, if you will, say is that Hispanics are not assimilating like other immigrants, that they're, they're, and that they're not learning English, that, they're, that they want that they're loyal to Mexico and not to the United States. And, you know, he's true on one point. Um, uh, assimilation or acculturation or whatever you want to call it is not the same now as it was in 1910. We're talking about a completely different kind of immigration uh, at a completely different time in our history. Uh, however, Hispanics are learning English, and they are embracing the United States culture, and they're joining the military, and, and, and they are adopting our values. But the thing that you need to keep in mind, and I think that what's going to ultimately solve any resistance that there is to so much immigration, and, and, and you see the same phenomenon in the Asian market, or the population, as you do in the Hispanic population. If you look at the adult population, it's largely immigrant. They're largely bifurcated markets. Uh, Hispanics, something like 60% of Hispanic adults are, are immigrants. Something like 75% of, 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 of Asian adults are, are immigrants. If you look at under 18, it's the complete opposite. Something like 95% of, of Hispanics under the age of, I, I think it's closer to 90% of Hispanics under the age of 18 were born in the United States. And it's, it, it's slightly lower for, for Asians. But ultimately what's going to happen is you've got a whole generation born in the U.S. that's going to grow up. They're going to have kids. Now you're talking the third generation. They're going to be that much more removed from from, from immigration, they're going to be that much more like Americans. And the other thing to keep in mind is they're changing the mainstream. So they're not going to be the alien people that their parents often appear to be. So I think that, you know, the, 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 real, the, the real cure in terms of any kind of hostility is, just, is going to be time, and it's going to be acculturation. Let's open up for questions then. Uh, 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 Robert has the microphone. I know you have something there. So any, any one of the panels you want? Hi, um, my name is Chris um, Songalia. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm originally from the Philippines, and um, I came here in '98. And um, somebody from Liberia, um, Mr. White, um, said something about when he goes to Liberia, people think of him as American. And when I go back to the Philippines, I usually visit the old country. Um, my family think of me as behaving like an American. And so my question right now is um, here is that about how these groups, how I just call them these groups, the immigrants, the, you know, the cultures, are they changing America or is America changing them or both are trying to change the other? And um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering about that because I'm also kind of wondering about what it, what is it, what makes an American? Um, um, and what will be, you know, what's its implication in, in, in the context of marketing? Because we talk about, um, you know, how to market, but we, we you, you guys discuss about marketing it to a certain group of um, immigrants that still has that culture. But um, going forward, they will be, those generations would slowly be not become immigrants anymore, like my daughter. She won't be, she won't have that, 
I don't know, Filipino culture, which is kind of a weird because I have a, a, Spanish, a Spanish name, but certainly a nation feature. So I have that kind of, you know, I don't know, one, uh, for lack of a better word, confused. Yeah, anyone want to take um, that one? Uh, thank you. Okay. So. Well, let me first say that America has always been diverse in every which way. And that diversity is our strength. When a person is a, a, an immigrant and becomes an American, they're an American. This notion that, oh, the next generation, they'll be American. No, right now. That's what it means to be an American. So I want to say this not from a Eurocentric view, or, but just a global view of who we are as Americans, that we have always been a diverse, uh, rich community that when you think about the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and happiness, that's universal. That, I think, is so critical to understand as people move on from a sociological perspective, second, third generation, like myself, you tend to have a great affinity. Now, for me, um, my uh, grandparents are from Mexico on my mother's side. My grandmother's uh, family was from Smolin, Sweden, on my father's mother's side. And my father's father's side was from Hamburg, Germany. So I want to dispel this idea of we, they. Because to be an American is about a sense of who we are as a people. So, you know, uh, yourself from the Philippines as an immigrant and as an American, you're an American. I really want to caution us about the thinking about this from the standpoint of marketing. What does multiculturalism mean to us in America? And is there pushback? What does it mean for the richness of who we are as a diverse country and the contributions of all Americans from serving in the armed forces to serving in public life to advances in education to science? To me, this, this really starts to speak to the richness of where marketing truly can add tremendous insight. And that is marketing simply is about reaching people from how they see the world, not from a lexicon that of a particular race or particular segment of society. I have a friend who works for a multinational corporation, and his biggest issue was translating into their, their employee handbook into 165 countries throughout the world. Think of that marketing equation. So we're we have always been diverse, and I want to stress that. In marketing, if anything, it's a sophistication of understanding the term mass customization of how you have to reach out to people for how they see the world. And I think that's an important distinction that I'd like to make, and I'll turn it over to uh, other panel members as well. I just uh, One little story, uh, doing some focus groups with teenagers, and um, these kids, I self-identified as Latinos, uh, and this one kid, the one girl actually said, you know, I always thought I was completely Mexican. People ask me, what are you? I'm Mexican. I'm Mexican, I'm Mexican, Mexican. She was, you know, completely bilingual because she could say the same thing in English or in Spanish. And she said, and then I went to visit my, my family's village back in Mexico. And I realized, I'm completely American. <laughs> all the kids who were my age, all the girls who were her age were picking out their wedding dresses and their, their, pa their, their, their patterns for their, uh, you know, something for the, for the, for the China or whatever, because they were going to get married, they were going to start a family, and they were, you know, picking out baby kid, baby clothes already, and they were 17. And said, and I was just thinking about my new iPod, <laughs> and that's all she, that's as far as she could think. So she realized that she was, you know, she was doing the classic American thing of postponing, you know, ch marriage and childbearing and all of that stuff until she'd gone to college and she started a career, and then she was, you know, maybe started family in her 30s, like most Americans do, and she realized that she was quite dramatically and spectacularly different from her um, cousins and, and Mexican family members. The other is dealing with Mexican companies, uh, companies from Latin America that want to come up to the United States, OMG. They think that everybody who's Latino is in, their back, is in the palm of their hand all just walking in. 
that they're going to love everything they have. They're, they're assuming a great deal of nostalgia for their products, and they're just assuming that as soon as they find out that this product is from Mexico or Guatemala or wherever it is from, that they're all just going to throw themselves at these products. Well, that doesn't happen. It really doesn't happen. It's, uh, American consumers become, you know, the moment they cross the border, they start acculturating, and one of the ways they acculturate is they become pickier, they become more demanding. What have you done? A little bit more of what have you done for me lately? They still tend to be relatively loyal, but still, their, their, their level of expectations and their demands and expectations for packaging and product quality and taste and consistency, all of that starts to change. So uh, it's pretty dramatic, and uh, I always tell Mexican companies, please do not make assumptions about this market. If you want to come up to the United States, that's fine, but you have to know that you're competing on a different playground. This is a completely different playground, and you have to, have to compete. Yeah, so just uh, in, in answer to your question, I would say that in the great immigration of 100 years ago, which many of us remember at least vicariously through grandparents, uh, if not in more direct ways. Um, at that time in, in our country's history, there was a clear kind of racial and ethnic pecking order in this country with white European Christians being at the highest level and then kind of everything else down the rung. And the name of the game for immigrants, whether they were Russian Jewish immigrants or immigrants from other parts of the world, was really assimilation defined as um, do not, under any circumstance, speak your native language to your children who are born here because you want them to be real Americans. So that meant a rejection of the previous language. Yeah, you'll keep the culture at home because some of these immigrants still had to cook the way they did and, and, and celebrate certain things, but your child was encouraged even outside the home to, to not be like that. But what's happened is over the last hundred years with this dramatic demographic shift and particularly visible with the, the influx of Latino immigrants, uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants, Asian immigrants and others, African immigrants, that the whole nature of the country has changed in terms of absolute numbers and this all came through a period of 40, 50 years where we also underwent this radical transformation which I think, uh, you know, is seen through the prism of the civil rights movement that said, wait a minute, this traditional pecking order that was based on race and based on religion is, is not really that valid because everybody really is more equal. So now, here we are at the beginning of this century, we've got huge numbers of people in these communities, and the name of the game is celebrate your individual cultures and languages to the point that immigrants are encouraged even to keep speaking Spanish, keep, keep speaking Chinese. Yes, we want everybody to learn English, and when the children go to school, they have to learn English, but uh, we're actually celebrating the difference. So when you talk about what does it mean to be America, 100 years ago, being American meant going that way and assimilating. 100 years forward to today, being American means relishing, celebrating that diversity of culture. And I find what's very interesting I'm 50 years old and my oldest child is 18. He's just graduating high school. What I find is interesting is I'm a product of an ultra-liberal white Jewish family from New York that went through the civil rights movement and carrying candles and you know, kind of very left-wing and very, let's say, multiculturally aware. Uh, nevertheless, when I was growing up, and I went to school with African Americans and some Asian kids then, but nevertheless, when I was growing up socially outside of school, you know, I was in kind of a very narrowly defined social circle of white kids, often Jewish, kind of almost like me. Not because my parents dictated, not because I dictated, but because that's what people did back then. I look at my son today. My son's a white Jewish honors student in Westchester County, New York, and when he gets in a car with four friends on the weekend, I promise you, there's a black kid in the car, there's a Latino kid in the car. Sometimes it's a whole different world for him. And it's not that I wasn't open to that as a child, it's just our society was not, it wasn't happening, it wasn't encouraging. Whereas when our kids come of age and then they have the next generation and all these immigrants, their kids are born here, it's already happening. The Gen X today is, for them, color is almost a non-issue. They're not looking at it. And certainly we heard in General Mills' presentation, and I just want to echo this, We've got all these numbers here, what is it, 100 million Hispanic, African Americans and Asians. Their influence on our culture is a thousand times that. Music today, 
is African American. Fashion is coming from these communities. All the artistic and aesthetic sensibilities is coming from these communities. My son dresses and entertains himself through the cultures of these multicultural communities, not through a white Jewish mainstream culture. And this is what's really going to dramatically redefine, it already is, but it's going to continue, what it means to be American. So make sure your kids know what it is to be Filipino because their knowledge of that adds to how they will be American. Let, let me just respond one thing though, and that's this, I have a friend from uh, New Mexico and I said, tell me what your experience is like. He said, well, actually, I'm Spanish. Because their family was uh, in New Mexico before it was New Mexico. My, my, my caution to us is we all have an insight from our own narrative. And if you ask the Spanish in New Mexico, they're certainly not going to say that it was, you know, the white people were on the top. Quite the contrary. My standpoint is this, is that an American means about rights that are afforded to you, about equality. Our narrative is very different in terms of our sociological perspective, and that's language and culture. Even European Americans who speak English for many generations. So I want to suggest that the, the newcomer experience has always been part of our journey, always, and it always will be. In 20, 30 years from now, it'll be a whole other set of issues. But defining ourselves as an American is about the inalienable rights afforded to all of us. And that is a distinction that we have to find, especially for diverse communities that have faced uh, racism, that uh, internalized depression, and other things. Finding voice and finding narrative is important. And I think it's really critical that we talk about this. Marketing is one thing, but narrative is something else. And understanding the rights afforded to all Americans is what. I'm wanting us to always get back to because that's what it means in terms of equality, and fairness, and justice for all Americans. And I think that's an important distinction we need to make in this conversation as well. You know, I gotta say, I think Saul nailed it. You nailed it. Um, when, I, when, I, when I was researching the book that I wrote, um, I came across a sociologist at SUNY, at State University of New York, called Richard Alba. And he has studied the, the immigrants in the early 20th century, and he's looked at the, the melting pot phenomenon, and you know, in, a, in an attempt to extract insights in terms of today's, today's immigrants. And uh, I mean, again, you know, as, as Saul mentioned, clearly there, there are differences. The Hispanics hold on to Spanish, or at least try to, right? My, my great-grandmother, uh, my grandmother used to tell the story in her, in her thick, Yiddish accent uh, said, would say to the kids, we're in America now, we speak English. Uh, my name, we don't know where my name came from, Morse. So, uh, you know, they, 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 were, they were Polish, uh, Polish Jews. We think it might have been Moskowitz, but, you know, there was that desire to, to fit in. What, 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 what Alba has concluded is uh, certainly that assimilation is, is different now than it was back then, and there is a holding on to culture. But he, he says don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of sociological constructs because you don't have immigration of the magnitude that we have right now without immigrants changing the mainstream. That's happening now, and that's what happened in the early 20th century. And his argument, you know, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the book How the Irish Became White, but if you read stuff that was written in the press in the early 20th century during all, this mag during all this immigration, it is strikingly similar to what Pat Buchanan is talking about and what these nativist folks, there, there was an alarm at the Jews and the Italians. They were basically considered people of color. And in time, they became white. Yeah. I mean, when... when Yes. That's that, that's 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 a, I, I've got a, in my book a, a, a headlines of a, a story on Joe DiMaggio, and the writer was just amazed that, unlike other Italians who stink of bear grease in their hair, he speaks fluent English, and his idea of a Friday night is going to have egg rolls at the Chinese restaurant, as if that was the most ironic thing in the world. Um, 
that changed. They changed the mainstream. If I say the word tuchus to you, you know what I'm talking about, right? If I say the word schmooze, if I say the word confetti, you know what I'm talking about. We all eat bagels. We eat pizza. These folks changed what it meant to be America. They changed the mainstream. His argument is particularly Latinos, because of the magnitude of Latino immigration, are going to change what it means to be America, exactly what Saul was saying. The image, you know, I lived in Mexico for about three years, and, you know, I, 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 I am the stereotype of a gringo, you know, um, blue eyes. That, that image is going to change because a smaller and smaller percentage of Americans are going to have blue eyes. My children are, are mixed race. Um, so, again, what it means to be American is, 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 is going to change, and it's going to be more inclusive and, again, as Alba would, would argue, uh, as it has always been whenever you have this much immigration. The mainstream adapts, and the meaning of what it means to be America is going to change. How about a hand for the panel, ladies and gentlemen?